Uh, yeah, I oh, yeah, I've got it. I've got it on my side. That's fine. Yep. I like to see the little red flashing link before oh, us. Wrong. I think we've made that mistake before. Yes, we have, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask Pete again next week. Next week. Okay, and there's people gradually coming in, so I'm just going to admit. All right, so just to introduce, uh, this is the last of our three free webinars, and thanks, Pete. Uh, I really appreciate it. You Pete probably. and I go back a long ways, um, and funnily enough, I still value his opinion, so how about that? <laughs> so Pete's gone into functional medicine, I went into nutritional therapy, but we both have a background in strength and conditioning, exercise physiology, coaching, you know, looking after people from a physical perspective, which I feel gives us both a really nice grounding when we come into this arena of nutrition, sports nutrition, nutritional therapy, functional medicine, because more and more of those people exercising, so we're not necessarily looking to target exercise as much as we used to um, but still that there's that massive need so we still get olympic level athletes or at least very elite athletes but more and more you get in the lay person that's under a huge amount of stress who's doing stress management through exercise and instead of going to the pilates class they're uh, taking on ironman or the marathon or, or something quite chunky. So we've got some, I've selected some slides from Pete's talk last year at the certificate course. Um, so it's a kind of representation of how Pete works. And I want to kind of get the best out of Pete tonight. And that's his practical element. So he's got theory, he builds theory into his talks. But I think his strength is the practical, what he actually does with his clients. And I think he's really been honing his own clinical practice for the last, you know, how many years? Lots. So I want to hone in on that. Functional medicine and sports nutrition, apart from stuff we write about, you'll never see the two things mentioned together. You know, that one's clinical and one's, uh, well, sports. But actually, we can, we can pull them together. And I value pulling them together because every sports person, every athlete, every recreational athlete or exerciser is clinical in some way. So the pyramid I represent with the, the course is get the base layer right, get the health right, then build up the performance strategies and then throw some supplement strategies on top. So we're going to go into the health there more tonight, but we'll see how it goes. And P and I can talk, so I'm hoping for quite a, a good sort of fluent interaction. And also, are you okay, Pete, if we kind of open up that people chuck in questions whenever? Absolutely, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so we can make it interactive, interactive from you guys as well. And we've got a nice number. It's not too much, not too little. So unmute yourself, throw in a question at a good point, try and keep it relevant to what we're talking about, or just do that little uh, message bar and, and I'll get the message and, and ask Pete the question. At the end, we will um, do a Q&A. We'll try and keep it within an hour and then I'll, I'll sort of finish off. Okay, Pete, over to you. Um, yeah. I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, and then if you remember how to share your slides, you can get them up. Well, I might need some help from that. Um, first of all, I really appreciate actually um, everyone listening in tonight. Um, so from my perspective on that, it's, um, it's always great to, to get people on board to listen. So as Ian said, we, we, we go back nearly 20 years. Um, if you like, we are exercise scientists is probably uh, the best way to describe our background. But really very, very early on, so nine, 1996, 97, I started hearing about this thing called functional medicine and for me it made a lot of sense and I got invited to a lecture um, um, by a man called Jeffrey Bland who if you like is the godfather of functional medicine um, and what was really interesting about that the lecture was called the heart on on fire and it was really um, a, a day's lecture on sort of new side of cardiovascular medicine and cardiovascular disease and what was 
hugely revealing about that day is that number one, here's a man who was who was talking about cardiovascular disease and in a completely different way, but he was doing it so eloquently and justifying everything with so much great science that for me that was the start of me thinking, you know, this is this is me, this is how I need to start practicing because here is a man who is putting the sort of um, the parts to the whole and and that was really my my pathway into understanding functional medicine and really for the last 20 years now I've been down a functional medicine pathway I suppose the key for me is 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 trying to understand and describe to layman what functional medicine is and and, and really the, sort of the closest I get to, and I'm being simple terms to patients, is in, in medicine, modern medicine really, that allopathic method is, is um, defined by what is it? What is it the disease that you've got? What is the disorder that you've got? I think what functional medicine does very well, it asks the question, why is it? Rather than what is it? And I think when you do that, the lens that you apply so those two questions is very different. So if I'm defined, if I define a patient as type two diabetic, my question is, well, why have you got that? What is it that is bringing you towards that definition? And then we, what we do then is we take the steps back to discover what that is. Is it genetics? Is it the way they're choosing to live their lifestyles? And that question completely changes the way that you treat people. I think why this is important is that if I can give you an example of where certainly my practice is now, my practice has literally exploded in the last two years. And I think that is on two things. I think more and more people are understanding functional medicine and a functional medicine approach. But I think more and more the traditional medical world are starting to understand that functional medicine really is a, it is a, 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 a new way of us looking at chronic disease. And so that's why I think it is, is super important. And I think what underpins functional medicine is we use what is, is in a sense called the systems biology approach. And I, I suppose, again, what is the definition of systems biology is that we are a sum of the greater parts. So if we translate that to athletes, and all we ever do is train them and not take into consideration everything else about their lifestyle, we are failing to understand our athletes. And so this is something that is absolutely crucial for when you're looking at athletes. And this is, of course, is what um, Ian's course is trying to teach you, that it's not good enough to have um, understanding of training. It's not good enough to have an understanding of sports nutrition. What you could be able to do is 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 a be be like a a GP to athletes. You have to have an understanding of every aspect of their lifestyle because every aspect of their lifestyle goes into every aspect of their training that goes into every aspect of their results. And so, and we've talked at this at length. And what's interesting about the science is the science is really starting to reveal that some of the, if you like, some of the primary reasons why your athlete is failing is something as simple as they're in a stressful relationship. And what we can do now is layer on the systems biology science to, do, to, to get you to understand that if I'm out training all day and I've got to go back to a house where I'm not getting on with my wife, then that becomes a fundamental stressor that interferes with my recovery, that's going to interfere with my sleep. And so some of the questions that we ask, and as you get more and more experience as a practitioner, that I, certainly I do with my patients, is that when we go on to understanding where are we going to get our biggest bang for our buck with regards to results, it might be that I need to have a conversation with that relationship that they need to sort out, because that is one of the primary ways that we're going to get this patient or this athlete to start having a little bit of space, a little bit of time where we can get those recovery processes going. So I think it's a good time for us to move on to the slides. Uh, and you might have to bear with me here because uh, I am the biggest technophobe ever. So hopefully, Ian, have you got those on? 
Right, just uh, share your screen. Yeah, hang on. So this is where, hang on. Sorry guys, this is where I, I look rather silly. Um, meeting. And that was after the pre-meeting tutorial. Oh, I know, well. I know, I know. Share screen. Right, I think we yeah, could. Yeah, cool. That's and good. then pull up your slides and then press play. Are we good on that? Okay. Okay, yeah. so if everyone's good with that. Um, and um, me and Ian had a chat um, about a week ago, just preempting what we were going to talk about here. And um, I think this is quite an interesting slide because what this slide is doing, this is a, a group um, from Spain. And what's really interesting about this paper is that this is really the first time that I've actually seen sports scientists actually take a step back and suggest, actually, is the model and the models that we use for dealing with athletes outdated? Um, and this is a really good paper that is getting into understanding things about maybe we should be looking at athletes from a much bigger systems perspective and that you know what, what we really need is an approach where the physiotherapist completely understands the nutritionist the sports medicine doctor understands the nutritionist or the psychologist and they've all got to be integrated and they've all got to be some understanding of how we play each department within to that athlete and so really for me what this suggests is that and again and, and this is not so just from from backing on Ian's course, but in general medicine and science, we are more and more moving over to this athlete as a biochemically individualized person. I think the key to understand, and we'll go into the slides, is there is no one ever before or after that is ever going to be like an individual athlete. They are completely unique. So if we're taking uniqueness, you can't ever treat an athlete in the same way as you, treat, as you treat another athlete. And so this is where we're moving. We're moving both in medicine to this biochemical individuality. We're moving to this personalized medicine approach. I think what is happening in the sports science and sports medicine literature is traditional scientists are actually starting just to suggest, as this paper does, that maybe the way we've looked at an athlete, the traditional theories of how we look at athletes, actually may not be the most appropriate way. And what we've got to do is look at a systems approach. We've got to understand how all these systems are working at any one time that is either going to produce better performance or suboptimal performance. And so that's why we've got this paper up on the front because really serious sports scientists now are starting to say, maybe everything that we've done before actually isn't appropriate for where we are now. And there's, a, there's, always a, there's always a slide sometimes when I speak for Ian that I always use. And it really is that we are so far behind of where the literature already is, it would take you literally decades of reading paper by paper by paper to actually catch up. So that's us setting the scene. That is us giving validity, much more validity, that maybe Ian's course is actually way ahead of the game. I think it is, because what he's trying to do is trying to integrate a functional medicine approach to sports science. I'm absolutely clear for me that this is the future of where we are. And usually what happens, as, as we know in the, in the medical literature, is that it just takes a little bit of time to catch up. But people are talking. Yeah. And so people are wanting to go want sports scientists who understand this global approach and can be, more importantly, be really able to integrate it over time. And it's great that I'm talking today to you because I probably, out of most people, have had more time than, than, than most over the years to actually cock it up. So from, from making many, many mistakes... And over many, many years, you actually become better of understanding how it fits together. So I'm going to move us on. We just reiterated a few points with this slide. And, and this is real key slide because, sorry, let me go back. What I want to get off this slide is that 
every single athlete is completely unique. So you have to apply that uniqueness to every single aspect of how you're looking at them. Um, and if you don't do that, then you are missing the point with regards to this athlete. And that might come, that might be from a point of view of training methods, that might be coming to a point of sleep science, it will certainly be a component of the nutritional strategies that you're gonna use. You cannot treat them the same. If you do, you're missing the point of what you're trying to do from your athlete. Now testing and be able to get data and run that data over time will be crucial in this because you have to be able to objectively measure why and how and how things are working. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so if I look at um, our patient subsets that we always do, we're always going to run our patients through a three-month cycle. And we call it a three-month test-retest cycle because what we want to do is we want to investigate the patient. We want to determine a set of data or testing that we want to look at. We want to get the results of that data. And then we want to apply a strategy based on those results. And we want that strategy to last a time frame that is going to give us a therapeutic intervention. But what we also do from a three-month perspective is that if things aren't working with that strategy, and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you mess it up and you get it wrong, it doesn't allow us a long enough time to get it wrong. So it gives us enough time to know that we're going in the right direction because we're test retesting. But if we're test retesting and nothing's worked, patient doesn't feel any better, then we haven't gone six months to a year with a failed strategy. Do you want me to talk about the 80%? Yeah, I mean, I like the 80-20 principle in eating, but what's your 80% thing? So I presented, uh, I presented at a conference two years ago, and um, there is a certification through the Institute of Functional Medicine called a, an IFM Certified Practitioner. Now, for me, I was very lucky to, to be an early adopter to this, and I was actually the first one to, to complete the certification. There's about 25 of us now in the UK who have this certification. And we put on a rather large conference for clinicians and nutritionalists um, and dietitians. And one of the conversations that I wanted to have with them is that, I, is that I wanted to speak to all the IFM certified practitioners. And I wanted to ask them a question. And the question was, in their opinion, as a percentage of getting results with patients or indeed results with athletes, how much was it about the clinician's technical ability as opposed to the clinician's ability to understand the patient and apply a, a regime that was productive going forward with that patient? And we all came to an agreement that it was really about 80% of success of any program or protocol was the ability for you to understand your patient or your athlete. And we were very clear. And for, from someone who is, has a, you know, a very busy private practice with associates that work with me, we're absolutely clear when we have very complex chronic disease cases, it's not about the technical information that we understand, the biochemistry we understand, the cool testing that we can do, it's all well and good, but the question is, is that then we've got to be able to translate that data into a usable and very simple form that our patients are capable of taking that information away and applying it over a time frame. And so the skill really is more, certainly as a, I would like to think now coming up 25 years of practicing that I'm getting quite um, experienced at this is that it, for me now it becomes less and less about understanding the technical data. It's more about how I apply the sort of basic behavioral psychology to the patient. Because you can do the best tests in the world, you can be the most technically gifted um, technician as far as you understand all these int intimate biochemical pathways. But then you've got to be able to tell the story to your patient. And so the next slides are really my experiences of how I choose to do that, given that 
if all you ever do as a sports scientist or as a sports nutritionist is dig down into, into testing and more testing and more testing and fail to understand that that is not what is going to get you the best long-term results for your patients. It's how you tell the story of what that testing is, is 80% of your success. Okay. I would uh, certainly back that one up, Pete. Um, it's very much over years of practice, you, you win some and you lose some, but the better you can actually relate and listen and, and talk to the person and help them understand the journey ahead of them. Yes. The so, more likely you will retain them and have success with them. So there's a few things that we've learned. And as I said, I've had lots of experience and I've made a huge amount of mistakes through no one's fault. I mean, that's the beauty of that you, you, you know, you can't be experienced. And we're in a situation now that people are coming to see us. They're going to spend a, a significant amount of money if they're coming to see us for a period of time. What is crucial and important for me is that I have a very, I'm not going to say harsh, but a very honest conversation before we start, because that conversation needs to set expectation levels of what we're going to get out of that patient based on where they are and what we're prepared to do. And so if I'm very honest, is that we will probably lose five out of 10 patients after that first consultation, simply because their understanding of what they were getting into is not what they understood. And it's really important for us. We're very lucky now that we're very busy. So the fact that if we don't take someone on, that's fine. But, and we're in a very good situation now um, from a point of view of we can be choosy with our patients, but it's really, really important that you, ex you set expectation levels and you give them an understanding of what is likely going to be the outcomes. And in many ways, so I'll give you an example of a lady who came to see me yesterday. It's clearly a lot going on. But what I had to make her recognize was, number one, she has huge perfectionism traits. And so if she's not getting the perfect results in a month, that's potentially a problem in, in her side. And also, she has no, her life is so full. I said to her, where is the space for you to engage into your health? Because you're going to have to make some choices from a health perspective about finding time about maybe sleeping a bit more, you know, maybe doing X and maybe doing Y. And so that is always for me now, I'm at that point where it's really important at my stage now that I give them a very robust and clear conversation about what we're exactly getting into. For anyone who is starting a business, you must be clear on what is it that we're both engaging into. Because what many is, and again, it's happened to me many a time, hence the reason why it's evolved and evolved. I've gone into a, into a process with a patient. They thought they're getting one thing. I thought they'd gotten another thing. And then it doesn't quite work out. So I think from a business perspective, you must set out expectation levels at the beginning. When we're talking about behavioral psychology and the importance of how important you are as a practitioner, it leads us to the pop. And what I say on this, this is the power of the placebo effect, which is absolutely huge. And, and again, as you become more experienced um, with dealing with people, you understand a little bit more about behavioral psychology, you get to manipulate this really, really well. So let me give you an example that I always use 10 years ago. We had some athlete come in who um, wasn't in any teams, and I fooled him that we had some supplements that were just about to be banned. So if you use them for the next couple of months, they'll give you really good results, but you need to hurry up because they're going to be on the banned list for the next two months. Of course, they were nothing but basics, um, multivits and minerals. And he kept texting me and emailing me like, oh my God, I can't believe how strong I am in the gym. I mean, I'm literally lifting the weights. So there's a very classic example of the power that you have over your patients. So understanding you and understanding the power of behavioral psychology and how you deliver your message, message is going to be one of the biggest things that you can ever do for your patients and your athletes. And so I'm going to give you some examples of that through science. 
And this is a, a really nice study, but it's, it's, it's something that again is being recognized in the scientific literature for many, many years. That This is a really good from, from a 1957 medical text. It wasn't about the drug that the doctor was using with his patient. It was about the way he delivered the drug and he delivered the message, which are absolutely crucial. And as you say, I take you back to that multivitamin mineral that I gave to that athlete. And there's him thinking he's getting the banned products. And there he is in the gym lifting his PBs all the time. This is, uh, it, this is probably the best study I found. It was in you know, a very good medical journal, the British Medical Journal in 208. This is a study that warrants, <coughs> pardon me, a couple of minutes of talking about because it's really quite an important study. <coughs> pardon me. It was a study that was um, involving over 300 patients that were diagnosed with classical Rome 2 criteria of IBS. And so what they did is they split them into three arms. They put 100 patients on the waiting list. I just need to move something here um, because I can't, see the, I can't see the results. So Ian, you might have to... Uh, you might I, have can to read the, I can read the results. Okay, so let me tell you the story. So we've got three arms to this study. We've got patients that are put on a waiting list to see someone. We've got patients that are put on a very limited clinical visit that they're going to have a treatment that if they've been told is going to reduce their IBS symptoms. Now the treatment is what we call a sham treatment. It just doesn't work. But it was an acupuncture-like treatment that they thought that they were getting. So they thought they were having needles injected. There was no needles injected, but it felt like that. And then the third group had the same process as the second group, but then they had a consultation with a very empathetic clinician. So let's have a look at the figures. So Ian, I think it was about 22%. So the weight less control improvement of symptoms was 28%. So let's just think about that. Just by the fact that you're being told you're going to be seen, reduced IBS symptoms by 28%. Now, the limited, limited clinical visit. That was 44% improvement. Nearly half improvement, nearly 50% improvement, simply from the fact that you're off to see someone who may be able to help you with your IBS. Oh, and by the way, we're going to do a treatment. The treatment doesn't work, but the patients don't know that. And you can see when monitored again by own 2 criteria, that IBS has dropped by 50%. And then we've got the augmented clinical visit. And that's 62% improvement. Two thirds, 66% improvement from thinking I'm going to get better, having a treatment that's going to make me better. Oh, and by the way, having been able to have a conversation with someone who looks like they want to listen to my problems. So my point about this is this is the beautiful power of you as a practitioner you have these tools these huge tools to be able to manipulate the bigger picture of your patient this is something in clinical practice that we utilize all the time and so if you are in sports nutrition strength and conditioning whatever section it's important that you don't stick in that section if you're treating athletes it may be for me now I spend more time in behavioral psychology than I do in any aspect of medicine for the way we're treating people. So that's just a point where after 25 years, I think I'm going to get the biggest bang of my book from the results. I need to understand the body language of my patient. I need to understand the words that they're using, which is giving me a much bigger picture of what's going on. And then I need to know myself and how I manipulate that cons consultation. And then when you've got all that, and you understand the technical side, you've really got quite a powerful product to be using. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same as that. You know, it's all behavioral psychology if I reflect on the clients today. And it's trying to motivate them to change that you can feel is the bigger picture. Um, they might think they're just coming in for a diet sheet, but they, they go away with very different expectations. And I some think of them, what's 
I think what's important about this is that 20 years ago, even I would have felt, and you would have, Ian, that you would have felt this is soft science. What you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore the science that is coming out in the behavioral psychology world, in the sociogenomic world, about how humans work, how we link to other humans, and the power of that therapeutic relationship. So, and I think this is one of the major problems in medicine. And again, this was uh, something that I took out the Lancet a couple of years ago, four years ago, which was really uh, the Lancet dedicated, the Lancet, the world's number one medical journal, dedicated a whole half section of uh, one of the, um, one of the, um, um, one of the uh, issues. Uh, uh, issues from a point of view of actually maybe as clinicians, we are not understanding our patients very well. And I, I put this slide up because in many ways, my best consultations are when I just sit and listen. And I might introduce the consultation from a point of view of, Mrs. Jones, it's great to see you. I know you're having some problems. Why don't you just take some time to talk to me through them? And then I don't say anything. I will literally not say anything for probably an hour. And I will let that patient download. Do not ever think that that is not powerful medical science because the science is there to show that maybe what you've done there, the fact that you've given a person the ability to offload something that maybe they can't do anywhere else will have a huge influence on physiology, on hormones, on immune um, function, on the microbiome. There is just nothing that it doesn't touch. And this is the whole thing about the systems biology approach. If you do one thing in one area, it is going to touch every, every other area of that human. And so, um, I've been in, you know, we've been in the industry a long time now. And sometimes if I look back to my earlier years, I've done consultations and thought I've done a brilliant job. And actually that patient's not come back or didn't like my style. And so what I've been able to do, and we've had some good, good teachers and some good guides, is that a very long time ago, and again, Ian, this is when me and you were working together, certainly the first one on the left, we were very lucky to, to be able to speak to people in the bigger, in the bigger world, behavioral psychologists, et cetera. And, and one of the key aspects to being a great clinician is that you have to understand yourself because what you've got to be able to do is, is know what you're good at and know what you're not good at and work on those aspects. And so what this slide is showing is basically me, who I am as a personality from a point of view of both my uh, natural style and my adapted style. So in, in a sense, Pete at home, Pete at work. And as you can see on mine, what you get at home is what you get at work and vice versa. I'm pretty much the same person. But it's important for me to understand who I am, what my strengths and weaknesses are naturally, because what I want to be able to do is make sure that, that, is, that I understand that for when patients come in. Because what I'm trying to do is match my style to their style. If we do this, then suddenly the patient starts to suggest or the athlete starts to suggest, hey, this guy gets me. This guy's delivering information to me in a way that I get, in a way that my analytical brain gets. So here's a really good example. As you can see me there, I am very much, if you like, sunshine yellow. That is probably a way to de describe me. And so there are certain things that I'm very good at. I'm very good at the big picture. I'm very good at, at all putting things together. But I'm terrible at the detailed analysis. And I'm te terrible its structure and detail. Now let's imagine that athlete comes in. I know I can look, I'm looking at one now, Mr. Craig. He was in his early days, and I forgive him, he's, he's definitely chilled out a lot more. And um, Ian was very much an extreme blue. So he didn't like fluff. He wasn't that great on the bigger picture. He wanted detail. He wanted structure. He wanted to know how many more repetitions and what speed that he needed to do that decline? You know, why is it going to be over three seconds when it should be 2.7 based on the literature? My point about this is that there's a good, you've got to think about style matching. Because if I take you back to that 80% rule, 
getting the data and doing the technical side as far as testing is a small part of the job. What you have to do then is be able to deliver those results to a patient that is going to get it in the style of the way their brain works and their personality works. So I'll give you an example of, imagine that we've just some, done some nutrient testing and I've got a blue patient and I just send them a quick email to say, oh, just take a multivitamin mineral, you know, maybe take this one, take that one and leave it at that. That is probably the worst case scenario for that patient to go, oh, that's not very good. I've just paid all that money and I haven't got any analysis or any detail. So what is key for me is that I know if I've got that blue patient, for someone who is not natural, but good structure, good organization, I need to say, here's the multivitamin mineral, here's the company that you're getting it from, here's the dosages for you to look at, here's the research that goes with it, here's how you layer that in. You take it, you take it with food in the morning, because these are the people who are gonna email you back to say, do I take this with food? Don't I take this with food? Do I take it in the morning or take it in the evening? And so that's really, really important because the key is you've got to run with this patient now or the athlete. You've got to keep this process going. So my point about here is if you don't start to understand who you are, what your good and bad traits are, it makes it very difficult for you to get the best out of your patient. So this is where some honest self-awareness matters. Now, this is a, this is a very typical work up for an executive who come on on a very basic level from a point of view of cardiovascular risk. So they come in to see me, we layer some bloods, there's a few bits and pieces going on there. Um, we layer some more sophisticated um, cardiovascular markers, LPLAC2, which of course, if you don't know, is, uh, is uh, an enzyme that we see in plaque formation that really is telling us how stable plaques are from the point of view of cardiovascular risk and as you see this patient has an elevated risk meaning that this is a plaque that is unstable and is more likely to, to burst now on top of that we've done some mutual um, and lots and lots of nutrient testing which will be in related to that cardiovascular risk and lo and behold <coughs> sorry I've also decided to lay some genetics from a point of view of lipid metabolism now here's the point is that most of what happens to your clients is that suddenly they start to get lost and you'll see it in their faces. So the point about this is that science and te the technical side is all great. It's all fantastic. But you've, what you've got to do then is not lose your patient. What you have to be able to do is story tell this science. And so I had a very, very um, interesting time many years ago when Ian was with me, we were involved in a pro pro program for the BBC and I needed to go and get some um, media training. And apart from it being a really horrible experience because I was literally interviewed by BBC journalists who completely ripped me apart, which is what they were supposed to do. I left that morning with a very important message and that is Pete, no one's interested in hard science. People want to be told science as if you're speaking no older to an 11 year old. So you have to be able to tell an 11 year old what all this technical data means because they're not gonna get it. And so one of the things that we do is that we, we really look to, how do I remove barriers so that this 55 year old male executive gets and understands what the testing means? Because if they understand it on a very basic level, it means that they're probably going to go away and do what you've asked them to do. So be very careful with blinding people with science if you don't have the ability to tell it in a very simple story. Do you want, me, do you want to? Yeah just, yeah, just remind us what the 66 days okay. stands for. I think we're in a in a in a quite a sad state, particularly with um, I would say the general public and their understanding of how to get themselves fit or how to get themselves lean. You know, how do we fat loss? And 
I think there's some considerations. And again, I tend to use this slide a lot when I get people coming in who are starting. And that is because there really isn't a lot of evidence with regards to behavior changes, making behavior changes permanent. And when you're asking an individual to make changes, and we'll give an example, to make changes to their diet, if you like, you're not asking for them to do a couple of changes. You're actually asking these people to do hundreds, if not thousands of changes, permanent changes to their day when you ask that. Not only might they need to go completely shop somewhere different, there are lots and lots of things that they have to do that are permanently behavioral changes. My point to this is that number one is not a lot of science, but the only decent science out there, as far as I'm aware, is this paper. And this paper is stating that one, not hundreds or thousands, which when you ask your patients, they will likely have to do one behavior change to be permanent, takes on average 66 days. Now that's two months. So why is this slide so important? This slide is so important. So when your patient comes in and says to you, I've been doing this for, for a month now and I've not seen any changes. You bring them back to this slide to say, that's fine. Because actually on average, to do a permanent change, it takes about two months. For some people, it takes three quarters of a year to make that change permanent. The thing about this is that this is why it's easy to do things early in short periods of time, but it's very difficult to keep things going. And that is because it takes time to make behavior changes. And so again, you have to lay the, the appropriate story out to the patient to say, this is not gonna change overnight. In fact, if you look at the science, some of your behavior changes to be permanent may take us two thirds of a year to do. And you know what, you're gonna fail. And you're gonna fail at that behavior change pretty often, but stick with it. Because in general, by the time we've gone two thirds of the year, you'll have that behavior change. So that's why this is a crucial slide, because making athletes better, making people better, is really about behavior change. So you can do all the technical side, but then you've got to be able to bring that into a program that allows behavior change to happen. So give yourself the grace of understanding for you and take the pressure off you that you know for some people it's going to take them a long time to change. And also what this does as well, it takes the pressure off the patient or the athlete to, <coughs> to know that change may take longer than they think it's going to be. And I think it's working through the instant gratification kind of myth that we sit in. You know, people Absolutely. are expecting these 10, 12 week programs to suddenly change them. Yeah. But they're in it for the, the long haul when they come to the likes of us. Yes. Um, yeah, I think in terms of time to have some questions at the end, maybe just yeah. sort of uh, browse through this very quickly. And okay. then... um, this is a, a system of our, how I try to organize things. So I'll go through these slides pretty quickly, but it's a go to it um, scenario. And, and really this is quite important about how we work because what we're trying to do is we're trying to gather all that information at the beginning. Then what we've got to do with that information is we've got to organize it, organize it in a way that you sort of, you're laying an understanding how you're going to process this going forward. Then what you've got to be able to do is to go back to your patient and say, Mrs. Jones, we've gathered all this information and now what I've got to be able to do is try and organize this in a process that is appropriate to you. I'm going to talk back to you what I think is going on. I'm going to tell you how I think you have arrived at this position where we are now. I want you to tell me whether you think that is appropriate. And then what I'll do from them is I'll go away and start order, uh, ordering and prioritizing what is the appropriate test that we should do at this time and why. And then what we do then is we start the process and then we've got to track the process. There are certain, some really important things and that is, is that in most cases, for a lot of testing, which can cost a lot of money, I already know probably what the outcome is going to be. Why testing is important is because it gives us objective data. 
And that's really, really important because sometimes you're not going to see any, any outward symptoms that your patient is getting better for months. However, the biochemistry underneath is changing quite considerably. Although I think that depends on personality types as well. Absolutely. The more analytical that want the data. Absolutely. And some can't afford it. So yeah, yeah we need to I think the more it. analytical, the more data, they love it. Spreadsheets, everything. God, they can they can be very happy with it. And what's interesting about analytical, they're more likely to stay on their rigid and structured program because that's the way their brain works. Right. So I'm gonna briefly go over this, but obviously as a clinician, when we're looking at people, we do quite a lot of head to toe examination. And that is because there's huge amounts that you can find from looking at someone. So I think investigating into some kind of physical examination textbooks uh, or physical examination guides on YouTube, I think are hugely informative for, and I'll give you a, I'll give you a little example. Um, a, diag a deep diagonal crease on the bottom of the earlobe, when you read the science, is actually really quite a very good associated predictor of cardiovascular risk in males. So there's a classic example where you could look at that and think, mm, okay, there's something not quite right. A very gray pallor color where the lips don't look, the lips look gray and cold could be a good example of iron deficient anemia. So there's two great examples where you are already picking up signs and symptoms from basic physical examination. When you greet people and you shake their hands and it's a, 70 degree day outside and yet they come in and their hands are cold so immediately you're like okay that doesn't make sense it should be warm is that because you know they've got maybe Raynaud's disease is that because maybe they've got a suboptimal thyroid these are just sort of little things that can be preempted from head and toe examination so definitely something to investigate and explore because many people don't have the money to be tested and I think what you're doing there is building up a logical process of, we may need to give you some omega-3 fatty acids because your skin is dry, you're fatigued, the back of your heels are cracked. That maybe is giving us, and you've got dandruff, that might give us some real good pointers that are very much associated with lowered omega-3 fatty acid levels. <coughs> Ian, I'm going to skip that one. No, actually, I'll go back. So yeah, just give a quick, quick overview because these are basics of functional medicine. Yeah, uh, so really, again, simply when you've got complex cases, we're always trying to simplify things and organize things. So in many ways, I say to my patients, here's how we're going to start to understand why you've, you've uh, you know, come to the place that you're at. We're going to use our ATMs. A is antecedents. And antecedents really are what are the genetic predispositions that may have brought you to this place? Then what we're also looking at triggers. Has there been any events or subsequent time frames where something may have triggered off an event? I did a, I did a presentation at your conference a couple of years back and we, I took the, uh, the conference through a case study of a female marathon runner who was absolutely healthy um, until she ran a marathon and then had a pretty big incident in the marathon where she had a lot of GI issues. And from that point, she was never well after that. So that is a triggering event. And what I proved on that lecture was that here was a woman who her gut wall um, became very permeable from the trauma of both the environment and the marathon, and that set off a sequence of um, her immune system um, having to try and fight off uh, endotoxemia through a, through a more permeable gut, and that induced a, um, a depression for her. And so that's an example of a, a triggering event that starts to trigger the process of decline or dysfunction or disease. And then M's is really a question of what is it that is continuing to mediate the condition? And can we measure that? So for me, this is all about, okay, 
Um, if we took if we took that lady who 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 was clinically depressed after their marathon, the mediators were looking at inflammatory molecules. Can we measure and monitor biomarkers that are showing us some of the underlying mechanisms and processes that are continuing to mediate her condition? And so that's obviously what we showed when when we did that diagram. We looked at some um, some cytokines which are part of the immune system. And we also looked at some basic inflammatory biomarkers like CRP to give us an indication of that. Um, this was um, actually her, this was me working through her timeline from birth. Uh, and the two stars were really looking at <coughs> antecedents that may have predisposed her to problems with her gut. She was um, breached and had to be C-sectioned. And of course, there's Lots of evidence to show that babies that are C-section birth um, may in some always be immune compromised and always may need to be given probiotics lifelong. What we also know on the second star is that mum got uh, mastitis and therefore couldn't breastfeed baby. So here's an example of a patient actually who potentially from an antecedent perspective that immune system, that development of that immune system, which really your own immune system, your own microbiome develops up to about three years of age and is really heavily determined from a point of view of whether you're vaginally birthed or whether you're C-section birthed and importantly, whether you're breastfed as well. So there's two antecedents that may have predisposed that athlete to having issues um, in the microbiome and in the GI tract. So that's an example of the antecedents. Okay, so that is me um, giving some real basics to um, the much longer day that I spend on the conference from a point of view of showing how things look in probably in probably a more experienced practice and, and how you play things. So I'm good for questions. So as I said earlier, just unmute yourself and ask Pete questions or use the little um, chat bar and I'll read them out for him. And if none come quickly, I'm going to ask you a question to start. And that's in Johannesburg, I'm seeing a lot of people who are overwhelmed in all aspects of life. Um, and it's this three P's of stress, physical, psychological, physiological uh just like me when i started working for you and you said mate you're overtrained and i'm like no i'm i'm only doing this many miles a week but it's that life overwhelm that corporate people are taking on big challenges what's yeah. your kind of uh, approach if you've got an overtrained person that's obvious straight away um i think this where it comes to the honest conversation i think i think you, it, in my practice now, I can pretty much know whether I am going to get good results with patients based on how they're viewing the world. And some patients is that you can only help them from a point of view of how they currently understand the world at that present time. So if we go back to your example, I think the biggest thing to understand, I think, from a sports medicine and sports performance is that everything affects everything else. And so when you talked about stress, whether it is psychological stress, whether it is emotional stress, or whether it's physical stress, they all impact the body in the same way. And so many people that I see, many athletes that I see, they're already really at the complete edge of what their body can physiologically and psychologically and emotionally tolerate. And then they want to go and do more training on top of that. And so you've got to be brave enough to understand where the checks and balances are. And again, it, we all learn by our mistakes. I mean, you did that for several years, Ian, and wondered why you weren't getting anywhere. Um, yeah, we've all done absolutely. it. We all do it. And it's real key that you continue to, to, to impress that message on people. A lot of people are just not at that point where they're ready to take that on board. And as you say, that well, as, I, as I go back to we probably don't go any further with 50% of our new patients after one consultation. And that's absolutely no one's fault. But what we've learned is that 
they're not ready to take on board what they need to take on board. Yeah. And so again, you just become comfortable with, you know, I'm probably not going to get too far with this patient because they're not ready to, to be open to what you're suggesting. And I think that's a really key one, Pete, is um, if any of your less experienced practitioners don't take um, things that don't work out as necessarily something you did, it's, um, people need to be ready for the interventions. Um, and as a practitioner, as Pete said, you need to be brave enough to have these uh, very important conversations. And also thirdly, from what you just said was, you know, we've been through that kind of uh, training stress load and we've experienced it, we've burnt ourselves. Yeah. If you've got that experience as a person, I've got this kind of bigger thinking that, you know, as practitioners, we, we go through a life journey ourselves, And if we learn from our own <coughs> experience and journey, we've got that skill to give back to the clients. So reflect back on what you've learned as an athlete yourself and use that in your practice. It's very important. Um, okay, any, any questions, guys? Or are you just uh, quietly listening to us? So, so you can punch it through, or uh, we've got a couple more minutes if, uh, if anyone wants. I think everyone's just having their dinner, Pete. I don't think anyone's actually listening. That's all right. Okay. Um, We'll go on to the closing slides, but we'll still take questions uh, for okay. anyone who wants to. Yeah, just check the bar. Okay, just go on to the next slide and, and I'll sort of finish, finish off this. Right, go back a bit. <laughs> All right, so. Hang on. Yeah, there, perfect. Um, so we started this course last year um, and it's three five-day modules with webinars before, after, um, assignments, reading, etc. So it's a nice, nice big course. Um, we did it live last year, um, and we filmed it and professionally edited it. So now I'm in a sort of phase of of trying to just advertise a bit more. I guess that um, there's an online version of the course because a lot of people are not in London or able to get to London. So. For you guys, I'm feeling generous this week, so I'm going to do a discount. So just press one click. So the normal price for online is uh, 1999 It does cost us a bit less to run the online than the live course, but we don't want to scare people away from the live course, so it's a similar kind of price. Um, but I'm going to do a, a discount for people that have uh, watched this webinar of £500. So uh, as I say, it's uh, feeling reasonably generous. And just one more click, Pete. Oh, yeah, students, uh, it's usually £100 more than that. So I've dropped down the student price as well. So if anyone's in final year of a BSc or similar kind of study or a postgrad, um, there's a, a decent student price. And then one more click. If you register your interest, so you don't need to give me money, just uh, register your interest by going on the website and sending us an email by the end of Friday this week, then uh, you, can, you can get that price. So anyone who's been, oh, maybe I should uh, look at this course, then you can get a, a decent discount uh, this week. Okay, guys, uh, we, any more? Now we've just had a few thank yous, Pete. So I think some people were actually listening. So uh, that's cool. So thank you guys. Oh, just one more click, Pete, and we've got a closing page. So there's details. So you can go on the website or go on the Facebook or Twitter and just send us a message. Um, any questions that come back after we finish, you can go through any of these means and I'll make sure we get it to Pete. Uh, Zoran, you say question. So if you've got a question, just fire it through. Um, and we're recording this as well, so we'll also put it up on the website YouTube channel. Um, and what else? The slides, somebody asked me about the slides earlier. Um, the, oh, Zoran, how do I unmute? Uh, I will do it for you. Am I coming through? Oh, there you are. There you are. Um, just before you start, Zoran, um, just to say to everyone that, um, 
we'll share the slides with everyone tomorrow, okay? Right, Zoran, go for it. Yeah, uh, really, really enjoyable, Pete. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of parallels to what I do. Uh, I work with athletes on, on mental conditioning and mental performance, and um, the, the 80% was, uh, was definitely, definitely really, um, really important. Um, do you have any, do you have any practical suggestions on how to do, how to do that um, listening? Like you're saying, it's, it's very simple. Like there's active listening, obviously, which is something uh, we get trained in. But uh, is there any questions that you ask your, your clients to get them to just to tell them to, to, to tell you what's up and to do, to do sort of a needs analysis through, through act, asking them a question. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there's, you know, there, I think there are numerous texts with regards to motivational interviewing. I mean, even if you put that in, I mean, that would give you a whole host of texts. Um, I think body language, some good stuff there as well, but you know, even, you know, even extracting, I mean, we, one of the things that I show is that um, with some of the old questionnaires that we used to use, I used to leave intentional mistakes in there because the real analytical people were, you know, one of, that's one of the ones I show on the day is that she was highly analytical and really um, it wouldn't, it rub, absolutely knew that it was going to rub her up the wrong way if there was a mistake on the, there was a spelling mistake on the, on the, um, the process forms that we send out to her. But it's there for a reason. And that reason was, is that highly analytical people, their brain is wired to see that mistake and they'll be bloody unhappy with it. And so there are various ways that you can cleverly draw out what personality type the person is and understand their body language from a point of view of, are they open to suggestion, et cetera. Um, and so in, in many ways on that, I think, there's a, there's a brilliant book that I, that's called Healers. Um, and it's the book, the title is called Healers, but the undertitle is called Extraordinary Clinicians at Work. And I think for me, that is probably one of the most profound books in my clinical practice with regards to, you know, understanding what makes a great clinician. And it really is clinicians who understand their patients um, because regardless of what everyone thinks I think what we've done with medicine is that we've technicalized it so much that we sort of missed the point about fundamentally how humans exist and so in every way shape or form any conversation any consultation is really on a on a very deep down basis is about the patient will be thinking to themselves unconsciously and their physiology will be thinking, am I safe here? Is this a situation where I actually feel safe? And if I'm safe with the person, with what they're saying, with what they're delivering, then we're going to have a good relationship. And so again, understanding those sort of basic dynamics of how human physiology works is so crucial. Because if you're always in an uncomfortable situation, that is, and that, you know, I had one yesterday when I was reading the body language on it, there were certain things that that patient was not comfortable with. And, you know, I'm quite experienced at it. So I knew for me, this was a patient that I'm not sure I could have worked with. And so that's why I had to push the boundary from a point of view of saying to her, you realize your perfectionism is one of the key concepts here. And one of the key things that is probably influencing your health. And you have to accept that if you're going to consistently strive for perfectionism, number one, this is not going to work. And two, you're going to continue to be sick. And so there is a way that I think understanding all that stuff over time is, is, is really quite crucial. And I think there are so many books out there, but I think that is a really profound book to start with. Again, it's called The Healers. And the strap line under, underneath is, exceptional clinicians at work it is a study that's been done by two medics and what they've done is that they've gone i don't know what state in the, in the us it, it was but they've picked 
what they believe are the 50 most prominent clinicians. And when I mean clinicians, it could be an acupuncturist. It could be a cardiovascular surgeon. It could be an oncologist. Everything that runs through those, those things is all about human connection. If you do not have the ability to connect with your patient or, or your athlete, everything else is a waste of time. Because all you're going to deliver then is technical data that really probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And what I say to this is that if you look at professional athletes, I mean, real world-class professional athletes, hardly any of them, very few of them, have coaches who are gone down the traditional sports science route. And that is because sports scientists, and that, if you go back to that paper that we talked about right at the beginning, we've been led down this route that puts clinicians and sports scientists and nutritionists into silos. And what they don't know is how to, how to be with people. And I think that's why there's, you know, that's why coaches, you know, won't have probably technical backgrounds. It's be, but what they're very good at is knowing what to do and how to be with that patient. And with that brings safety. And with that brings an athlete that goes, yeah, I think I'm good here. This feels right. And so understanding that a little bit more, I think is really, really crucial going forward. So again, we're in a very lucky situation with my practice now and our team is that if we honestly feel as though we can't work with a patient, we can have that conversation straight away with them to say, honestly, we just don't think that we can give you at this present time what you think you need and what you're expecting. And here's the reasons why. And because the other thing about this is that in clinical practice, you must be able to protect yourself as well. And when I mean protect yourself is that particularly when you're doing chronic disease, we spend hours and hours dealing with people who are quite sick. And you can't take all that load on your own. Otherwise, you become the patient. You become the sick patient. And so that is why it's really important to set out what is important. So what I say to patients, they come and say, and, and this will be the line, can you fix me? The first thing I'll go and say to them is that I am absolutely not here to fix you. You will fix yourself, but I will give you all the guidance that you need to be able to start fixing yourself. This is not my journey to take. This is your journey to take, but you'll have me with you on that journey and I will step in at appropriate times to be able to guide you. But you've got to walk the path. It's not my journey to do that. And that's the other thing where, again, is that people need to accept their role in what they're doing. And if all they do is push it onto the coach or push it onto someone else, is they're not being true to themselves. And you're going to end up, as you say, in a relationship there is, it's not beneficial for you. So again, that's really key. And that's something I've learned and Ian will have definitely learned is that you can be close to burnout with patients who are expecting you to fix them. And so this is why good, honest conversations at the beginning are so important. And I think honestly, if you're starting off, I would start to think about writing your document statement to your patients about the relationship, about what my role is, but what your role is as well. So that they're clear before you get in and engage to them that, oh, okay, this is down to me, you know? And, and I think that's really, really important. I think that's brilliant Thank advice. Um, and I think I, I would like to do that as well. Actually write a statement to email out when, when somebody's booked in. And, it, and you're covering a few bases before they actually come in. Because uh, a lot of people don't actually know how you how you work, um, and I'll just add into that Zoran with what Pete said is, I think early in your practice the questionnaires, the testing, you know whatever your practice is, it might be exercise testing and structuring, you will find safety in that structure of these things. But as you experience, as you get more experience as a practitioner you learn to tune in much quicker. So I, I often don't even feel like I need a questionnaire anymore, but 
I still want everyone to do because they've already come in evolved having filled in the questionnaire because they've got uh, engaged in the questions. So they're already sort of engaging in what you're going to do with them. So yeah, and everyone's got different styles. Yeah. Pete's found his style, I've found my style. We work a bit differently. Um, we will attract different people as well. The, the kind of uh, the yellow and the red and the blue and green personalities. <laughs> That's an aspect as well. So it's about finding a, an approach that suits you, and it does take a wee while to to kind of unearth that. Um, so be patient. And but what I would also say to that is that you can only be as good as you are in the place that you are with the time frame you've been in practice. You know, it's all well and good. Twenty five years in now, me being able to deliver this, and it sounds great, but we all struggled and continue to struggle at the beginning and we did find safety in tech in tech. So, you know, it's a bit like when you first start training people, there's huge safety in three sets of 10, <laughs> you know, quite because 12 was you know, it not? Well, you know, all right. Depends what we want to look at eight to 12. So it doesn't, depends what we're doing. Um, but you know, there's no evidence to suggest that that is the right thing to do with any one individual. But it gives you that safety to start. And I think, as you say, you're only as good as you are at any one time with the experience that you've had. And we're all just on the, you know, I just look at it as that we're just further down the path than anyone else. But, you know, we were no better or no worse than anyone else 10 years ago. And we all had, we all had the same issues. I just think experience of being in and on it all the time just allows you to work out how you want to practice based on all your experiences. Thank you, Pete. Um, right. And I think we had some really good insights there and hopefully all of you have, have gained something from tuning in. Um, as I said earlier, if you get any questions um, that pop up later, just send, send an email through the website or through uh, Facebook or Twitter, we'll, we'll pick them all up. Okay. Thank you, Pete. Good. I need to run I'll, brilliant, mate. I'll share a beer soon, mate. I yeah, think I owe you three now, don't I? Huh? You owe me a few, yeah. <laughs> All right, mate. Pleasure. Yeah, I'll speak to you soon, yeah?